Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The View. This is Michael Tino filling in as lead person this week for Meg Riley, who is on the road, uh, and joining you from beautiful, sunny, spring-like Peekskill, New York, where after many, many months, it seems to have finally stopped raining for now. Um, it is good to be with you. We have the executive team of the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association with us this week, and I will introduce them in a moment. But first, uh, let's hear from our hosts, Aisha Hauser out there on the West Coast. How are you? Oh, I'm good. I'm Aisha Hauser. Yes, I'm in Seattle. Um, I'm doing well. It's May. Uh, Misha Sanders posted a video of what May feels like, and I so appreciated that. She's a minister. I believe she's in Ohio, and I'm going to say that I'm probably- Illinois. Impressive. Illinois. I knew it. <laughs> I'm picking a, a state somewhere in the middle. And it was just perfect. I was so appreciative because I'm like, it feels like May is 7,000 days. So that's how I feel. Uh, Chris, how are you? <laughs> I'm on day 8,025 of May. I am Christina Rivera. I'm joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. And um, yeah, it just seems like a really long month, a really long way to be able to get to June and July. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is, but it is what it is. So uh, let's see, who else do we have? Margalee, you wanna say hi? Hello everyone, Margalee coming to you from Connecticut. And at this moment, it is nice and sunny out. <laughs> Sorry to say, but it has been, um, we've had cloudy days and moments during the day. Right now, as we speak, it's sunny. But I'm also one who loves um, the cloudiness of, of a day. So, uh, but as you know, I will um, be checking to see what you're posting on Facebook, making sure that the panel here knows what you're thinking. And if you have a question for folks, I'll be posting it here for them to respond to. So uh, thank you for joining us. Back to you, Michael. And uh, joining us as guest host this week, we're very excited to welcome Julica Herman de la Fuente. Uh, hi, Julica, how are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I'm, I fangirled enough to actually be invited to be a guest host. That's so great. <laughs> and I'm in Michigan and the weather is temperate, but I'm having internal temperature regulation problems. So I don't know. I don't know how we are. It's hot, it's cold, it's everything. It's very exciting here in Michigan, but I'm really glad to be here. And, you know, we do talk about more than the weather on The View, um, and, but I, I'm sitting here, I've opened up the curtains and let the sun in my window, and I'm just so happy that the irises and the lilacs are blooming in my garden. So my house is surrounded by purple, which it doesn't get better than that. Um, we usually start our, our time with a, a little roundup of things going on in Unitarian Universalism, but uh, this might have been a very boring week for our faith. I don't know. Do, do we have uh, things that we want to note in Unitarian Universalism? It's a dull week for us. No. Um, I actually do want to name. So Carrie, I got an email from Carrie McDonald, not me personally. It was a mass email, I guess. There's this, um, I want to say it's a new initiative. I don't know if it's new. Um, hey, here's what's happening. And I don't know if it's going out to, um, Chris, you're shaking your head. So do you know, I want folks to sign up because it seems like a good thing to be a part of, but um, do you know more about it, Chris? I'm naming something that I'm not even, I'm being super vague, which is ridiculous because I don't remember the name <laughs> of what the initiative is. So it's an email that is going out from the UUA um, to loosely termed, and I'm going to say loosely termed to congregational leadership, folks who have been identified in some way as congregational leadership. And it really, um, I think, is aimed at talking, talking to, because it's hard to have a two-way conversation in email, but um, giving information and resources about um, um, you know, how to be a congregation within the UUA and what that means and, you know, how, how we are with each other. Um, I think that they're still working out the mailing list on this um, because we've certainly heard from colleagues who, um, you know, are absolutely in congregational leadership and haven't been on this mailing list. Um, so I don't think there's any shade in that. I think that the UUA continues 
to really struggle with um, data management. And we, we know this as it relates to religious professionals of color. There is no database. There is no way to contact us all unless somebody um, says, hey, you need to contact them and get on the list. Um, and there's really no tracking. It's one of the things that's been named by the Commission on Institutional Change as, as really, really challenging. Um, and I know that it is a priority for um, the current UU administration to try and, and figure that out, figure out how that's gonna, how that's gonna work. So um, I would imagine the, the email is available on the UU website, UUA website, who knows? Um, but if people are listening to this and you want a copy of it, um, shoot Asher or myself an email and, and we'll get you a copy of it and you can ask to get signed up for it. And it's a great idea. Shout out to the UUA and to Carrie. I think it's wonderful to have that. So. I was saying it as a good thing. Thank you, UUA. Yeah, we appreciate attempts at better communication and delivery of services, right? Yay. <laughs> other so things two that... other things that I will oh, mention. Um, so yeah, because you know. <laughs> um, the blue Black Lives of UU uh, bailout, Mama's bail, bailout uh, was this past Sunday. Uh, for Mother's Day, and it was wildly successful. Shout out to Allies for Racial Equity for really doing a great job modeling what it looks like to be an ally. Um, all sorts of information available on the Black Lives of EU page, Allies for Racial Equity page. Um, I think at last count, I'm going to round it, I think it was like 88 uh, mamas were bailed out just on this initiative alone. Um, and it just goes to show what, you know, a few committed folks um, can get done. And, um, you know, a thank you to all the people who donated um, to that or shared the post or just really kind of had a listening circle or a listening party. Um, that's really awesome. And then the one was the other thing. Oh! Yeah, so we had um, some news, you know, right out of Alabama um, this week about uh, women's reproductive rights. And um, I think one of the things that I will highlight is, you know, we knew this was coming, right? I, I don't think that this was a surprise. Um, and so I would really, um, at some point in the future, we need to talk about how um, we are addressing this, you know, as Unitarian Universalists, um, because it, it's important. And um, I'm not going to say a lot about it here because it's not what we're here for today. Um, but I'm I'm a little disturbed at the lack of um, strategic initiative around this. Yeah, and, and how we're going to organize uh, both statewide and nationally and um, protect people's reproductive freedom um, in, the, in the name of our faith, right? So um, I'm with you there. Uh, so, one final Elizabeth, thought on that, Michael, is that it. let's organize not on Facebook. Like if we're going to get ready to actually break laws that are in unjust and should not be in place, then let's not do our organizing on Facebook. Let's do it in a more intelligent way. So that, that's part of the conversation that I've seen happening this week that I think is important. Speaking of Facebook, I think one of the issues that we, we all need to be um, attentive to is which leadership to follow because mm -hmm. Facebook shows that everybody's trying to lead something and everybody can't be the leader so some of us have to be followers and we have to figure out who we're who's leading who's following and how are we working together in in the work of love and justice thank you melissa and so um and thank you for piping in and we should probably introduce our guests before we get too much farther into this conversation um so we have the executive team of the unitarian universalist ministers association commonly known as the UUMA, but I try very hard not to speak in acronyms right off the bat. Um, and uh, I will introduce them 
in uh, the order in which they came to work for the UUMA because they are uh, a team of equals. And that's part of what we're, we're going to be talking about today. So Jeanette Lallier started working for the UUMA in 2003 as the administrator and is now part of the executive leadership team as the director of operations. Um, by training and passion, she is an opera singer living in New York City. So I wave at you down the Hudson River. Hi, Jeanette. Uh, the Reverend Melissa Carville Zemer, uh, also part of the UUMA executive team, is the director of collegial practices. And we're going to learn what all these things mean in just a minute. Um, and the Reverend Derek Jackson, uh, and, and Melissa, you are you are in Western Massachusetts, correct? Um, and the Reverend Derek Jackson is the director of education as part of the executive team of the UMA, and you're in Chicago, correct, Derek? So um, I, I wave at all of you too, but uh, Jeanette, you're closer to me. Uh, so, so what what do all these things mean? Director of operations, director of collegial practices, director of education. Let's start there. Can you can you tell us? Um, what those things are. Jeanette, you want to start? Sure, yeah, always finding my mute button. So uh, we, um, as we moved into this executive leadership team, we really saw, um, we were lucky with the three personalities who happened to be at the table at the time and, and um, thinking about what doesn't match. Like, you know, building a strong budget or running operations it shouldn't necessarily be some uh, the same skill as as someone who's really strong in education and designing a curriculum, and shouldn't uh, should all of should all of these tasks be talents of one person? And so, as we sat down around the table, we were so blessed really to see the people who were sitting at the table we thought about what what works what works and um we came up with these three three positions uh, of operations collegial practices and education and it happened that we had three people doing those so operations is just everything that makes the organization work from paying the bills to making sure that we are um, an organization that has fair hiring practices and good policies around staff and compensation, um, that we are an association poised to do uh, good work. And uh, I'll let my colleagues talk. Derek, you wanna talk a little bit about uh, your, your portfolio? Yes, uh, so as director of education, uh, my role is the continuing education of our ministers and providing opportunities uh, for continued learning. And some of that is through workshops and programs that um, are settled by our chapters can do, um, resources that are available. Um, we have an institute that we've actually just renamed the Institute for the Learning Tradition. Um, because of the importance of learning. Um, and so putting that, that major program together every three years. Um, and also with my big project this year is launching um, a online learning platform that um, will provide access for continuing education that is that meets particular needs our ministers have, have mentioned around uh, affordability uh, and time. As, as really barriers. And so we're looking at, I'm doing a lot of work at looking, how do I provide education where people are and making that as accessible and challenging people to grow um, as well. That continuing education is an important piece of who we are as ministers. I'll pass it on to Melissa. My position was the hardest to name and we're still not 100% sure that, that this is the enduring title that this position should hold, Director of Collegial Practices. So I. I oversee and um, lead our all of our programs, ministries, and services related to collegial life amongst ministers, which, you know, I'm just going to asterisk is a whole project that we're working on because one of the things that's clear to us is that ministers don't mean the same thing by collegiality. And we have, we got to tease that out and figure out um, how to help create more alignment around that. So collegial life, support for ministers, accountability for ministers, and I also oversee the ministerial formation network, which is about formation and support for those who are becoming ministers. So if, uh, if someone has a 
question for the UUMA. Um, who do they contact? <laughs> <laughs> That's that that is part of our part of our learning um, and part of just the culture change that we're in the middle of. We do I want to say we do have a lot of shared executive responsibilities and um, all of our job descriptions are on our, our web page and we have an FAQ, you know, I have this question, who do I call. Um, it's on our web page and we tried to publish that to our membership as we launched into what I should say, I don't think I said at the beginning, is an experiment. So we are an executive leadership team pro tem. We're in the first year. Uh, we think it's going terrific and we anticipate recommending that this is a leader, um, uh, a leadership style that, that works for this association and we want to further grow in that. Um, our Thank you, Melissa. Our website is uuma.org. Um, so anything big picture, organizational development, ARAO, um, anti-racism, anti-oppression, multiculturalism, strategic planning, monitoring. Um, if you're a, a group and you don't know who your liaison is, we try and separate liaisons. Um, you can always write to all of us at execteam at uuma.org. And we'll get to all three of us and the person who's most, we will either talk about it. We spend a lot of time, um, that's one thing shared leadership has taught me is the importance of connecting with each other and getting our heads on the same page and thoughtfully responding to things that come in. And so exec team at uuma.org gets to all of us, but if you know it's something that bill didn't get paid or you know how does the UUMA handle um, their um, legal situation, this legal situation, that would all come to me. If it's some sort of collegial issue or something about a minister in um, formation, uh, that would be Melissa. And if it's anything regarding continuing education, and I should also say Derek uh, leads our um, um, development work. So if you want to give money to us, Derek's the guy to call. <laughs> um, I have a question. When you all announced that you were going to try this collaborative model, um, did you get pushed? A, why did you try it? Why even attempt this? And two, did you get pushback from your membership who are super attached to the hierarchy and uh, minister as monarch? Hashtag not all ministers. <laughs> I'll, I'll start here. Um, I've had three job titles in three years at the UMA um, because I came, I left my parish ministry position to become the associate executive director and my predecessor um, resigned several months into my first year. And then I became the acting executive director and very quickly in that first, in that year of being in the, in the acting role, um, it became clear to me that I wasn't willing to work that much. I have two young children. I have a life. I want to have a life. I want to be a parent and uh, I, I, I need to have a reasonable job that can be accomplished in enough hours that will let me attend to the rest of my life and the things that are important to me. So that was, the, for me, that was a very strong personal imp impetus. And I think I, we hadn't even hired Derek yet. And I began sort of dropping hints to Jeanette, like, hmm, what would you think about being a part of a team within the first months or so of being in that role? And then once we hired Derek, we began, we began sort of talking about that amongst ourselves. I began talking with the president of the board of trustees, Reverend Sherilyn Walker, and um, amongst the leadership of the board and, and uh, amongst us, everybody immediately embraced that as a, as a positive idea. And it became it, like it, it justified itself as we talked about the scope of the job. It's an enormous job. You know, there's 2,400 members of the UMA um, and there's many responsibilities that the UMA needs to um, needs to advance. And so it made sense to all of us. I would say, well, I'll, how about one of you speak to the reaction of the membership? Um, I, I might add a little bit to that too, um, as part of what uh, excited me and interested me in this team model is, uh, and as part of it comes from the work that we are doing as a faith um, and as an institution around dismantling white supremacy. And that to me says that we need to rethink our structures of leadership. And so this felt to me as an opportunity to rethink what we are doing and how we are engaging and uh, move to a way that uh, 
that breaks down some of those hierarchies um, and um, strengthens collaboration and pulls on a, a new way of being and living and breathing in leadership. Um, and I think what was particularly I thought was really important was having Jeanette as someone who is not ordained be a part of the leadership team, because I think that's an important piece to show that you can do leadership, ministerial leadership, and not have everyone ordained and what that means and how that we work together and hoping that that actually we, I see this as a way of modeling how we can actually engage as ministers and those, as religious professionals who are ministers and, who are, and those who are not ordained can work together as a team. And I think, and I felt that was really important for us to explore and engage and model um, and struggle with. Um, so that's a really important, that was really important for me. And um, we've, I would say that we, I was surprised at how receptive our membership was. Um, uh, because uh, change is change and we were in the midst of a lot of change. Um, and so I expected a lot more. We did get some pushback um, and most of it was, I would say the reaction we got is some people said, oh, I'm not sure that's gonna work, um, but you know, go ahead and see. Um, I didn't see a lot of, uh, we need to stop kind of everything and push back. It was more of just, I don't think that can work. Um, and uh, that for those particular people, it might, that might, this might not be a model that they could actually see themselves fitting in. But I think it really fits in with who we are as the three. And I think it is a model that can uh, be beneficial. And we found it, you know, I can speak for myself and I think I can, I'm also speaking for the rest of the team that we found that as a beneficial way of, of sharing leadership and actually having the support and accountability needed to actually do the work that that needs to be done. I would Jeanette, be really. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Derek. I, I'm sorry, Jeanette, were you going to add something? Okay. I would love to follow up on that and dig a little bit more because I know that both Chris and Aisha have been part of leadership initiatives in their congregations. Some of it has gone well, some of it not so well. And I would love to hear from the three of you, what is a lesson that you have learned as a result of this experiment that you would like to share that you think translates for ministers learning how to share leadership with other religious professionals in congregational and community settings? Like what, what have you learned that has been hard, wonderful, unexpected. I, I think um, the word that came to mind as you were asking the question, Julika, was intentionality. I think from the very beginning, we've been intentional. Before we even started, we found places like the Congregation and Summit to talk through and ask them what went well, what didn't went well, what didn't go well, what they struggled with, so that we might. Um, learn from from those who are doing it well and then we got a, we got coaching and so we've worked we had a wonderful uh, retreat at the beginning of our time together and talked and really fleshed out job descriptions so that we know whose lane is whose who's driving which bus and who and um, what are shared things and you know we've refined those as we find what works and what doesn't work um, and then I think the third thing that was key is board support and really having a board that um, we can talk to about what's working and what's not working and what we need for this model to succeed. Um, so that's been my, the biggest struggle I think, and, and we learned this from the summit is the time it takes. You know, the, the, you know being collaborative takes time. There's a, it takes a lot of time to sit and, 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 and I personally love that because it encourages me to respond to things when they come up rather than react because I don't just shoot that email right back as I would if I felt like I was a solo lead and I needed to respond to this right away. I take a minute, I step back, I talk it through with my colleagues and then we decide who, who among us is best to respond and, and such. So Derek, Melissa, I don't know what other, I haven't found very many challenges. <laughs> I'm loving it. So. I I think that there's a lot of benefits and I will speak to a challenge, but I want to just lift up a couple more benefits. I also think it gives us an opportunity to hone skills and, and talents and strengths and that we don't all have to do that. Like in, you know, in my, in my acting role, 
I attended the UUA's Common Endowment Fund report because we our endowment is invested there. My eyes glazed over. Like, I don't know how to manage an endowment, right? But, you know, Jeanette can, Jeanette can dig into that and really specialize in that and like attend to our financial health and then, and then share with us, report to us and report to the board, but we don't all have to like have that skill. So that's a wonderful benefit. Another benefit I think it's important to name is that, you know, that we individually and our board and the UMA as a whole really has a commitment to dismantling white supremacy culture, working toward that end, to centering our, our commitment to anti-racism and anti-oppression and all of our practices. And having three people who have that commitment at a table when we're making important decisions or even discussing issues makes it more likely that we will attend to that commitment because whoever is the lead on that thing may be bogged down in the details of whatever the question is. And then the others of us have just a little bit more distance. So we can say, well, what about this piece of that? What about that piece? So that's really good. I think one of the challenges that we we're still kind of trying to figure out is um, how to keep the lanes clear. There are some things that we have to share and attend to as a team and to be, to, to advance our work, we also have to have clear lines of, responsibility and authority for the things that are ours. And we did a lot of work on that in the beginning. And what we're finding now are the places where lines can't be drawn neatly. And so what do we do when the lines aren't neat and the, the boundary crosses? And then how do we help educate people about that as well? And I will add, uh, in terms of benefits, is just the mutual support that you are not alone. And um, uh, one of the things I don't, and we, I don't think we've actually talked about this is we do a peer review um, with each other. So um, we alternate each week uh, sharing with, with each other a piece of, of our work that we're doing. Um, and having that time of to have to kind of one, just dig into something that we're working on and talk about and reflect on it, and then getting their feedback is really just helpful to help you move some of those questions that I'm struggling with this and giving some really understanding to. Um, it has to, I think we have asked this question to each one of us at some point is, that sounds like a lot. How can we support you? And you have that space of kind of saying, well, you know, actually, there's nothing that I can use support right now in this, but maybe if you can help me in this area, um, that would free me up to do for more energy this so that be able to really look at that and to question the capacity of what we can do and actually say are we trying to do too much and have those really important questions and so i think that support is really helpful um i think one of the things i think is really important in being able to do this work is that you have to you have to uh uh leave your ego at the door that uh if you're coming into this with, you know, I've got to do things my way and, you know, my vision is the right vision, um, it's not going to work. Um, and there are many times that uh, we, and I think all of us, we've come up with an idea or a thought and we've talked about it and it, what we end up doing wasn't exactly the idea that we had, but it shaped what we did. And we, you know, and I think we've come with things better from being all our pieces. And if one of us was so stuck, well, we have to do it my way. I think we would have we wouldn't be able to do all the things that we are able to do and move. And so to be able to say it doesn't have to be about me, it's about what we're doing as a team is really crucial. And I think is the only way that this can work is if you're willing to let go um, of that piece. And because I think you can do this without having the e leaving the ego piece and still be fully yourself and engage and not lose, you don't lose anything in this. Um, you just, you, you gain by the community, but you do have to let that go. And that's, an, and that's, and I think it's a, it's a learning piece in order to do that. Thank you all. You know, I just, I do want to say, um, Asia and I can joke with one another uh, because we've known each other a long time and uh, Asia knows among others that I'm one of the ministers who's on team collaboration. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, Asia speaks the truth when she says that many, if not most, uh, ministerial colleagues of mine, um, are, are attached to hierarchy in some, in ways that are sometimes unhealthy and, uh, sometimes even abusive and destructive. Um, and so I'm really, I'm excited that my minister's association is modeling collaborative leadership with 
with a team that is not all ordained people. Um, because I, I've seen enough ministers struggle with collaborative leadership amongst ordained people uh, <laughs> to know to know that that extra level, that extra layer is is important. And and I'm I'm wondering, are there tips that you've all learned in this year of experiment, uh, particularly around uh, that dynamic, uh, that that um, congregations that want to create leadership teams that are not all ordained people might learn. Um, I want to lift up uh, Reverend Melissa Carvel Zemer because she really, um, we were just talking with our coach about how we can all be seen as equals, and and it, it's clear to us that Michelle, uh, Michelle, Melissa is is in the front, so Melissa needs to step back. I need to step forward and Derek needs to hold firm and have a, 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 an equal voice in the, in the position in part because of our, our um, the status of ordination or, 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 lay, or lay folk. But also there's a, a unique um, aspect here. I've, I've been working with the UUMA for, 2000, for 15 years since 2003. And when they hired me, I was their first professional um, administrator. Before that, the, the position had been either part-time or held by a ministerial intern, kind of trying to fit it in and just kind of get membership dues, catch as, catch can. Um, so that was the first step for the UUMA to say, we want to be professional and have professional uh, professionals work for us. So I've been in the position so long that people just see me as Jeanette does everything. You have a problem from password resets to whatever I can get my Kindle working. To, so so um, I, I'm, that, I'm that person. So uh, we're working hard, or I'm working hard to separate the legacy, so to speak, of Jeanette versus the position of director of operations. And Melissa really enabled that. The first thing she was right that we sat down uh, to lunch when she was just kind of newly as acting um, executive director. And she said, Jeanette, do you know what you do? Do you know what you get paid? How is this possible? How can you get paid this for what you do? And I've always been so grateful to the UUMA because even though the salary was for what was in my job description, maybe not a match, it, there's so many other benefits to the position. And Melissa said, we need to think about this because either you need to do less or you need to get paid more. And um, I think what you're doing isn't really equal to what your job title is. So Melissa um, really naming that and, and saying, and the way I work is collaborative and do you wanna be collaborative? And woo, it was like, we were speaking the same language. Yes, because I want to be more, I want to grow. And I think that's what I've done through my work at the UUMA. Um, and I can, I can do that best when I'm in a team, when there's somebody else holding the watering can. So, um, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but but it's a struggle. It just in terms of the legacy of my, of the position and the growth of the position, and I think that that it takes stepping back and stepping up in order to work well. Uh, this is Marga Lee. I um, it's pretty obvious hearing the three of you speak that you play well together. Um, that you share your roles, you make sure to lift up one another. So when you're working amongst yourself, I, I can imagine that works really well. Now we are, we live in a world, we are part of an institution that's, that kind of uh, has relied on hierarchy for a long time. So how, when external forces are in play, when someone wants to go to Melissa or insist on going to you for something and, and really and you know, maybe possibly dismissing um, your colleagues, Melissa, like how do you make sure that you lift them up um, when external forces are involved, when other people would, and so on, when those things are in play? How do you, how do you all make sure that uh, your, your colleagues are respected and, and lift up uh, and so on? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's an important, it's an important, um, for, for people who are considering collaborative leadership, I think it's an important thing to be attentive to because 
the, there's also the factor of habit, right? People are just used to the UMA being hierarchical. And so even if they know, like on the one hand, the habit is to think that there's one person in charge. So um, we, we in, a, in our weekly meetings, we talk about you know, all the things. And so if there's something that's coming to me, that's really not mine, I will fill them in, give, you know, get whoever's it is with the context and then, and then pass it off. And we also do a lot of forwarding of emails. Like if something comes to me, that's not really mine, I'll forward it to Derek and copy the person and say, Derek is actually the lead on this. And, and we try to like, we try to do that regularly and make it clear in our, so, so I don't respond to something. Um, and then, um, because that would reinforce that, okay, you actually can, I actually will take care of that. I will try to just forward it along. What would you say, Derek, in the, in the, in, from your place? Um, I, I, it's definitely that. I think it's also um, uh, creating space for each other. I think we do a good job of when we're, um, we're, we're meeting publicly, where we're meeting with the board or doing this, or trying to share space time and space um, so that um, we're, so we're being we're conscious of who's um, in space making sure everyone has has a chance to get voice really being clear of who's doing um, what so that if questions come that the right person can actually respond and and can be seen as the leader in each area and so that I think that conscientiousness of oh yeah I may be able to answer that question but uh, this is Jeanette's role and so I'm going to uh, let Jeanette um, respond to the, even if I know the answer because that's that just reinforces um, each one of us what are where our portfolios are and I think that's that was really important oh my gosh and I just want to add to that because we we we've worked together enough now that we know that Jeanette is the raging extrovert of the group and um and I am sort of like the medium range talker but a little bit behind Jeanette and then Derek talks the least of the three of us and so um, sometimes like we'll tease each other, like someone, you know, the board will ask a question and I will just be coaching myself, do not talk, do not talk, do not talk. <laughs> you know, someone else has to respond to this question. <laughs> and sometimes we'll say to Derek, um, Derek, you need to talk more. Yeah, and I think um, we're also working through when uh, being able to say in, especially in the board meetings, because that's in this first year, we've had the most experience as a team, right? Um, we haven't talked about that. So, you know, they ask us something in the moment. Well, we, we would like some time to reflect on that and give you a, a time. And, and that, that is a intentional practice. Or we say, well, I can't speak for my colleagues, but this is how I feel about things. And, and so that, that takes some, that, that's been taking some navigating for me too. You know, and I end a lot of sentence with with Derek, Melissa, please correct me. <laughs> so, <laughs> For, from what I'm witnessing the last half hour or so, you're you're modeling an enormous amount of respect for one another, um, which I totally appreciate. Um, I imagine that sometimes though you disagree, and maybe even over like major things in the way the UUMA is going. So, what happens then, or has it happened yet? Or is this part of the experiment? Can I make you disagree about something? Uh, to, to, because you're going to have to disagree at some point, right? What happens then? I think, um, I mean, we haven't had, I wouldn't say we've had huge major disagreements, but we've had some disagreements around things and we talk it through. Uh, I think that's the important piece of it is that we have a conversation and um, it's about talking through, listening to one another and um, and I, 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 I think I would can say for all of us is that we have an approach as, you know, we are looking at the larger picture. And so we are, um, we, you know, we make, as long as we make sure that our, 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 what we think is important has been said, and we've talked it through, we respect the consensus decision of the group. And so if it moves in a different direction, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I've kind of shared, I've given the concerns why, and, and I listen to why the other opinions are, and sometimes that actually changes my opinion. Um, and it's like, oh, okay, I hadn't thought about that. And sometimes it's like, okay, I can see that it's not exactly how I would, I, this, I'm naturally inclined to do it, but I actually see the wisdom in this way as well. And so I'm willing to move in that direction. I don't think we've had anything, and you can guys correct me if you can think of something where one of us has had such a 
like really we went in a way that just someone just blocked you know but really felt i think we just really just talk it through and really listen to one another and i think that's the key um and trusting the um the consensus of the group uh, which consensus can only really work when we're all understanding what the, the true, what our true vision is and what our mission is and key to that. And I think we, when we go back to that, we always, we can come to a, a common uh, agreement. So a follow-up question that comes up for me is, well, one, one thing actually I want to reflect back first is I hear that it takes a long, longer time and more intention to navigate this, to discuss. I wonder if on the other side, you're also going to start moving at the speed of trust, as Adrian Marie Brown talks about, like that there's this other place where once you're solidly in a place, some things get decided really quickly and efficiently because you're in this collaborative energy. So let's assume that the second year is going to have more speed of trust moments. And I'm really curious to hear how you're going to leverage the power that this collaboration is going to give you and where do you want to take it? Because my guess is it's a, it's a good experiment in and of itself, but it's also in the service of something else. And I want to hear in the service of what, like where are you taking this experiment and what, what do you intend to do with your collaborative leadership? Well, for the benefit of the members of the UMA and for and rippling out beyond the members into the Unitarian Universalist world, I think one of the things that we we understand ourselves laying the foundation for is for my, my the seat that I hold to shift yet again, because with Jeanette moving into the director of operations role and taking on, especially now that we're hiring an administrator and we had awesome candidates and I really hope we're going to make an offer this week. So we'll have a full-time administrator, which will really then give Jeanette the opportunity to move fully into that role in a way that there's been some limitation this year because of the, there's an enormous amount of administrative work with a, with a cloud office and a continentally dispersed membership. So we, so back to that, that hire in particular, that position, Jeanette's ability to move further into that role is really laying the foundation for my position to move for more fully into the direction that the new guidelines revisions indicate and which the board has been beginning to discuss too, which is increasing support for members of the UMA, particularly um, uh, around um, not not professional supports necessarily, though that's a part of it too, but also just like emotionally, personally, spiritually, the work of ministry, increasing supports for ministers in that work. And also um, um, developing our accountability processes. We hope that the outcome of this ethics summit that's going to happen next week is going to mean that we'll have a common ethics panel, the UMA will be part of that. And so um, we imagine that as those as those changes happen with the guidelines and with the larger UU world, that this position that I'm in is going to be able to really move more into like a, a, a ministry of support and accountability for a minister's role. Um, but that remains to be seen depending on what happens with the guidelines. What would you two add? Um, I think uh, um, another place where I see this. Uh, moving is, uh, I mean, I think it's the modeling uh, of like that and kind of our conversations as we continue to talk about what it is that we are doing and how that um, will be able to, uh, I mean, we haven't really talked about this, so I, but I could see us being a resource for others who are want to explore doing this sort of collaborative uh, ministry and, and how that that would take shape or form. I, we haven't really talked about what happens if people start asking us about how to how to do that. Um, but I could see that as part of uh, that this has been successful and as you know and as it continues to be successful, that how the people who want to do what we are doing um, to be able to be that resource in some ways. And we'll need to think about ways to to manage to be able to do that as well as do you know this complicated job that we have um, because we could probably go on the professional circuit and then 
you know, do all this and then not do our regular job. So we'd have to manage that. Um, but I, I do think that that's something, you know, maybe there's some some writings that we might do um, as we do. A, a, I mean, I think there's many different ways that we can share about this, this experience that I think is beneficial for the larger faith. And how we might want to do that um, is something that um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, communicating about what we're doing, but just I think that's a place that we might want to think about a little bit more. I think this is just one piece in the the entire um, culture change that the UMA is is approaching. I think of it as foundational, just like when you know, 15 years ago, the UMA said, this isn't work for some ministerial intern, we need somebody who knows administration. In order to, to really live into the values, the UU values, we need to say, okay, let's let go of the I and become a we. And, and, and this is just kind of setting the base. So I hope that when we're humming, people won't even notice. People won't think about the leadership structure. They'll just see that everything's working in such a way that we can really do the things that are important to make ministers stronger, healthier, vibrant um, participants in the faith so that the faith can, can really come alive in the world. So I think it's really um, important kind of what you all are talking about is how this will look like in the future. And I think, um, you know, one of the things in doing shared ministry in a congregational setting, we hear a lot, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, what if the next person who comes along who's the minister doesn't want to do that um, and doesn't share that as a value? And, um, and, and, and so my comment to folks is, is don't hire them, you know, don't call them. This is now a requirement of ministry to be able to do shared leadership, to be able to do shared ministry, not just with your colleagues, but with your congregation. And so that this is not something, a lot of people, at times people kind of frame this as experimental. And, and I push back on that and say, no, no, no. No, the experiment was trying to do it that other way. And we knew that, you know, we've seen that that experiment is, is failed, has failed. You know, that hierarchical way of doing things has failed. So, you know, what we're trying to do is, is broaden the idea of what can actually be successful. And so, um, you know, I just encourage you all to, to continue, you know, kind of that modeling and framing of that this is, the, is a new way. And it's, it's not just, you know, new for the sake of being new, um, but um, really reflective of, it's new in this culture that, that is here, but it is not new for a lot of people who do this as part of their community. So in, I know in the, in the Latinx community, this is part of how we interact with each other, being in collaborative leadership. Um, and so, you know, kind of that reframing for people of, you know, is it really new? Is it really experimental? Um, and, and what that kind of says about the lens that people are viewing it through. And the question I had is if you all wanted, because I think it's, it's already changing how the UMA is relating to the other partner um, professional organizations. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted to talk at all about the ethics panel that's going to happen next week, um, because I, I don't know if that would have happened um, had the UMA stayed in a, a more hierarchical um, frame? Well, I'll start. I, I'll be um, I'll be attending that pan that summit next week. And at this point, we have I think almost twenty people attending, including representatives from the UUA um, staff the Ministerial Fellowship Committee, the credentialing committees for the religious educators and musicians and all the professional associations. And when, when, we, when we, the UMA approached the UUA about this idea almost 18 months ago now, we were thinking about merging the UUA and the UMA's accountability processes. And there's a whole host of reasons why 
which I could go into if, if people want to know about that. But so that was our initial goal. But very quickly, we thought, well, um, Lareda and the Mu Musicians Association also have credentialing committees. So the circle expanded very quickly to include them. And we did not initially think about the professional associations that don't have credentialing committees because part of our goal in merging these processes is to create common accountability procedures. And there's a question about how does that happen when there isn't a credentialing body that um, has authority in the same way that a professional association has authority. But we've, we've um, we have been, the, the planners have been asked to in, uh, include all the professional associations. So we are grateful to do that and regret that we didn't think of it initially. And, and that's part of the conversation is uh, the context of the conversation. I think that we have to acknowledge straight up is about the differing, um, the differing structures that support religious professionals across Unitarian Universalism and the differing, um, power roles those those professionals have that's all part of the context that I think we need to discuss as we figure out how do we get to a shared ethic of accountability for all religious professionals whose idea was this panel who where would the impetus come from it came from the UMA and we brought it to the UA and um uh, we're I just I'm, it feels like it's been forever getting here so I'm really excited that it's on the horizon That is exciting. We have we do have some comments. People are watching online, and I want to make sure that that some of them have questions. So uh, Marie Gerstel Manning, that's Twinkle, right? Yes. For those who've been here, um, do you sense that a majority of your UUMA members want to see the culture change to more shared leadership, or do they need to learn to let go of the hierarchical models UU ministers have had to date? Marie Marie wants to know that. I, I think that um, much of our membership is open to the concept. It's a nice thing, but they don't quite know how to get there and what that looks like for them in any given situation. I, I want to name, I also see a comment about, um, yes, staff are people. I think a lot, I, I think many, my experience with, with ministers is many, if not all ministers do value their staff, which is a little different than being able to step back and share um, leadership with that staff, right? So it's, I love my administrator. I wouldn't be able to do my job without them. But that's different than stepping back and and sharing the leadership with with your administrator in ways or and and religious educator and and the whole staff. So I, I think it, it, you know it's it's going to take a while. I in the same way we didn't get a lot of pushback. I, what I sense, and, and we really haven't talked about this, so Melissa and Derek may have very different opinions. Um, I, I get a sense of, yeah, that wouldn't work for me, but I love the concept. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I, that's what I hear a lot when we talk, when we go out on the circuit to talk about shared ministry, about the model that we have here, about the model that Summit has, about the model that Aisha's done. Um, and and I I do that. I start naming off all of the places that it's existing in the UU universe, um, that we had tribe presidents, that we have co-moderators, that we are actively, like this is part of the future of Unitarian Universalism, and it's not something that people are going to be able to opt out of. Um, and I think that, you know, I think religious educators and and um, some of our other professional organizations have a little bit easier time saying we want this because it's it's not us who are giving up the power, right? It's not us who are using our power in order to um, create space for those who've been disempowered over the time. And so I think that, that I think you're exactly right uh, that, you know, it's, it's like, oh, that's a nice thing that they're doing over there. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's one way of looking at it. And another thing of looking at it is, oh, hey, there's a the thing that I'm going to need to know how to do real soon in order to be called to a congregation. Um, and, and that's going to be a shift. And I, I, yeah. well, I think I, I, I 
and I think that one of the things, and this is actually laying into what I think about the work of continuing education and some of the resources, because I, I don't think for all people that this is something that they can easily switch to with switch to. And that is not the way that ministers have been trained over time. So there requires a lot of more resources and training in order to do this. And so um, I think as we as this transition is happening uh, and moving into more communal models, it's thinking about how then do we resource those who um, weren't trained in this way and really have no, um, you know, I think about, you know, how, how we learn. And some people, it's not even in their conception. They, they can hear it, but they can't even conceive how to do in a different way because that's not how they are. And, you know, that's, that's you know, how they've learned. And, you know, at some point, you know, we can see here are opportunities to learn and see if you can move in that direction. But I think that this is part of, I see this as a, a movement and the transition um, as we hold all these things that there are people who there are ministers now who are are really primed this is how they've actually got training in this and this is how they naturally um, are, are are geared and so they are ready to move in this and there are people who uh, are going to need a lot more work in order to move in this direction and I think there are also congregational systems that are really set for these particular people also to be able to minister within but things will change and shift over time. Um, it's not going to be a next year, all the chant congregations are going to change. But I think the holding that space of there are those people that are going to need a lot more than just saying you should do this, but actually are going to have to actually change. It's actually a, a, it's a culture, it's a worldview change that's massive. And some, you know, where people are on the, on the spectrum of learning can actually cross into that next thing. And some people, that's where they are and how to hold them in that space. We know you're here. And I think that's part of our work that you made. We know that some people are here and that's, you know, we're going to affirm you as there. And also saying that there's some new changes happening and to affirm that new growth as well. And I think that's some of the work that we do in the UMA is being able to hold those, those places. Um, oh. But move so towards growth as much as possible. Thank you. So as we begin to wrap up, and before I ask our guests for some final thoughts, I want to note that Asia Hauser, co-host of, of The View, is literally co-writing the book on shared leadership. And I'm wondering if you have two minutes of advice that you want to share, Asia, or you can pass on that too. Um, I, no, yes. I'm, I'm working with the Reverend Deanna Vandiver on a book on collaborative leadership. And actually, uh, this team, uh, Jeanette, Melissa, and Derek, were very kind and were part of the people we interviewed. Inclu we interviewed Susan Frederick Gray and Karen McDonald and a few other folks. The big thing is intentionality, exactly what was named here. And collaborative leadership is not absent of accountability. And I think that's what gets folks, well, how would it work? And well, who's accountable? Well, of course there's accountability and it does take time and it's worth it because I'm sorry, this hierarchical uber patriarchal model has not served humanity. And I don't say that to be hyperbolic. So the book is, um, it's coming next year, soon as possible, but we're working on it actually. I just uh, start with, yes, we're working on it. You're, very you're writing it collaboratively and it takes time. It does. And Dee and I have a lot of fun together. So it kind of keeps us from, you know, if, if we if we didn't like each other so much, it probably would be finished by now. So, but thank you for lifting that up, Michael. So Jeanette, Melissa, Derek, any final words from, from you? Thank you so much for being here, Jeanette. Thank you. I, I, I want to say, because it hasn't been named, and, and I think it's important, um, we are truly equals among equals and even financially so. I, I think that's something that isn't always the case in, in leadership teams um, and to hold, I, I mean, when we came into it, I was making the lowest salary. Uh, so we put all three of the salaries in a pot and split it three ways. And I, I just wanna lift that up because that took, a, I think that's another barrier. When, when so many of our ministers come out of um, theological school with tons and tons and tons of debt, not only are you, uh, is it hard to step back from leadership, but it's hard to step back from that salary that you've been waiting to get for, for all this time as you keep putting money out. So I wanna just thank my, my colleagues in this, in this forum for um, really living their values in, in 
in every way possible. So, and thank you for having us here as well. I just want to lift up the joy because I think that the one of the things that comes out of this is that we uh, we enjoy being together and I actually found the collaborative process to lift up the things that are just joyful about the work um, and about each other. Uh, and I, I feel we've grown closer together in this work. And um, I think that's an, it's a great benefit of this to be able to celebrate the joy of leadership together. I want to add two things. One, I just want to, uh, we've been focusing on our, you know, shared leadership and experiments and shared leadership today, but I also want to affirm that there are ways and people um, across our UU world do practice ways of being, um, engaging in shared ministry and collaborative leadership that's still within a hierarchical frame. So I don't think it's an all or nothing proposition. I think that there are ways to move toward collaboration. Um, which aren't as radical as, you know, completely re rearranging your structure. Um, and I also just want to lift up that w our work is not, um, you know, the, on the only work. Like we couldn't do our work if we didn't have fabulous staff working for the UMA, if we didn't work with an awesome board of trustees. And uh, just end that by saying that we're so excited that Julika is going to be the next intern for the UMA, the next ministerial intern. And we've had an awesome intern in Sana Saeed who is going to be staying on when her internship ends as our programs assistant. Awesome. That's fantastic. So news. And yes, your membership is also very excited that Julika is joining you as an intern. So this has been The View. What a wonderful conversation. Next week, we have Elias Ortega Aponte, the incoming president of Meadville Lombard Theological School. Um, and we'll, we'll make sure to, uh, to talk with him about what he thinks it's going to be like being a non-ordained theology professor coming in to lead a theological school. Uh, training ministers. Um, so this conversation will continue. And uh, this has been The View. Have a wonderful week. See you next Thursday.